breakout session and lunch. We're going to have another keynote talk before we report back on the breakouts. And we're really excited to have Albert Slap come and talk to us about work he's been doing in coastal risk and flood modeling and data needs. Great. Well, thank you, Beth. Um, <clears throat> and thank you all for coming back after lunch and not uh, going out and enjoying the beautiful scenery here in Boulder. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm very honored to be asked to speak today, um, and I want to thank Albert and Guy and NASA for including me. Um, I give a little bit of a different perspective because I'm an entrepreneur um, in a startup. I'm not a scientist. I have scientists that work for me, and uh, so I'm going to give you uh, more of an entrepreneurial overview perspective of how we use data um, and also how we may use EO or uh, remote sensing data in the future. Uh, mostly in the United States, we don't, we don't really do that right now. Um, so I want to just um, first give you a little bit of background on myself because I'm probably the least qualified person in the room to be talking about science. Uh, for 40 years, I was an environmental trial lawyer. Uh, I mostly represented environmental groups like Sierra Club and Waterkeeper in anti-pollution cases. Um, most of you are too young to remember Three Mile Island case, the meltdown of a nuclear reactor uh, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. But I represented the environmental groups <clears throat> to keep the radioactive water out of the Susquehanna River case. That was the only case I had that went up to the United States Supreme Court. We won that case and we kept the radioactive water out of the river. But um, I retired actually in 2014 for about two weeks. And then some scientists, uh, Dr. Leonard Berry and Dr. Brian Soden, I think some of you know about Dr. Soden. Um, he's at University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. Um, he's a world-renowned climatologist, and uh, shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Vice President Al Gore and some others. And they called me about two weeks after I had retired, and they said, well, we had this really great idea. And the idea would be to take flood and climate risk modeling and try to downscale it to the individual parcel level, and then to make it available to people. Because we have people here you know, who do a great job for the insurance companies and do a great job for um, you know, trying to set premiums um, at, at a correct price, but there really hadn't been a consumer product, uh, a product that you could go online uh, and, and you could get the high quality information about your risk. So that's what we set out to do pretty much in 2015, 2016. And then in early 2016, we launched floodscores.com. And our, our mission was to save lives and protect property and increase resilience. And so in this uh, talk, and, and if there's a burning question, go ahead and interrupt me. I don't, you know, I don't mind that. We're going to describe what COSORIS does, what data sets we rely on. We're going to discuss the challenges to take our system global. And we're going to discuss how new technologies like IoT real-time uh, will benefit from pre-event modeling. One of the first things that I want to say, which is my, my opinion, is that the bad news isn't good enough. And I kind of said this in the answer to, you know, it's a discussion we were having earlier, and that is that we have a lot of bad news, and not every property has bad news. I mean, some property that we model is very good from flood and natural hazard risks and climate risks and sea level rise, and even properties next door to one another might have different risks. Um, and that depends on elevation and, and, and a lot of other factors. But you could have a company that comes along and says, oh, that bad news isn't good enough bad news. We have better bad news. Or we have the best damn bad news that money can buy. And if, if, if only you will listen to us and, and, and go with the best damn bad news money can buy, then everything will be fine because obviously when the regulators, when the local politicians, when the 
bureaucrats from the counties and the cities and the towns see that you've come along with the best damn bad news that money can buy, of course they're going to do the right thing. They're going to get resilient. They're going to invest money. People will raise their homes out of the floodplain and, and, and you know, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. And that's not true. And we all know that's not true because people have good enough bad news in the United States right now to make reasonable decisions about buying insurance, which they don't. Um, I'll say it again because I, I think it's funny and probably true that most people in the United States spend more money on lottery tickets than uh, flood insurance. So why? Why is that? Is it just a matter of getting the best bad news? And then there's another thing, and that is if we provide the best damn bad news to the top down, the politicians, the, the county commissioners, the, um, they're going to create flood barriers and giant pumping systems, and, and they're going to save everybody. And Boston's going to have a $20 billion storm surge barrier, and we're going to have a big U in the base of, of Manhattan. And, it, and, and implicit in this is the sense that a hotel, an office building, a townhouse, hey, why should we spend our money when the town, the city, the county, certainly not the federal government, but um, is going to save us? Why should we spend our money when they're going to save us? And that's not true either. And we are located in Fort Lauderdale. We work for the city of Miami. We work for the city of Miami Beach. And they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to begin to raise the roads in Miami Beach and put these giant seawater pumps in. They call stormwater pumps, but it's really not. Because every time there's a storm, you know, the electricity goes out from FPL and most of the pumps don't have backup generators. But when the sea levels rise and the king tides, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit, they don't save everybody, and people do get flooded. So we're, we're talking about personal responsibility, bottom up. Yes, we work for local governments, and we give them our thoughts about adaptation and where they can make cost-effective investments. But I personally believe, and my scientists, Dr. Berry, Dr. Soden, and others, believe that to have resiliency, we have to have both top-down and bottom-up. We have to have all of the above. We can't just have top-down, we're going to save everybody, it's going to be wonderful, and bottom-up alone because individual property owners don't control the streets, they don't control the stormwater system, and so we have to have them both together. So what did we create? We created a a modeling and risk communication engine. And you can see our reports on floodscores.com. And why do I say modeling and risk communication? Because we're a bit like um, Carfax. I don't know how many of you know what Carfax is, but if you've ever bought a used car, when I bought a used car, and I'm looking around the lot, and the salesperson comes running out holding a piece of paper. It's not a platform, it's not a website, it's a piece of paper that tells me what the insurance claims have been on a used car based on the VIN number. So we're sort of like car facts or flood facts for individual properties around the United States. And we do that because most people who need a professional grade report to buy a property, to sell a property, to insure a property, to protect a property, want something more than, well, I saw that on the, my phone. Wait, let me get my phone app. You know, no, this is a report. It's very highly visual. And so we produce these both, um, and I'll just go to this for, for I want to, uh, go, okay. So we produce spreadsheets based on properties. Uh, customers give us a list of properties and a spreadsheet, and then we fill in columns of risk. And in this case, there's, six columns of risk, which I'll go over, but I wanna just go back here for a second. So we started with the tides and sea level rise and riverine and heavy precipitation and storm surge. This particular um, image, we had done a model for this hotel uh, 
on Brickell Avenue in Miami. And uh, this was uh, just a, a, a visual of our Cat1 modeling. And it shows 3.3 feet maximum inundation above the ground level. And that's the model down there. And this is a news crew during Irma that was standing across from the hotel there with four feet of water. We modeled 3.3 feet and it was four feet of water for two days in a Cat 1 hurricane. And that doesn't say a lot about the resilience of the city of Miami. If a Cat 1 hurricane, just a Cat 1, can push four feet of water down Brickell Avenue for two days, it's not a resilient city notwithstanding they're a member of the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities. So we've added natural hazards, uh, wind, tornado, wildfire, earthquake, and tsunamis, and we're adding extreme heat stress, cooling degree days, and drought. So what is the fuel that runs this engine? Um, the fuel is big data. In the United States, we really don't need um, a lot of remote sensing and satellite data because we have a lot of free data sets. But when, as I say, when we're going to go global, then we're going to need uh, additional data. We've pretty much sold in all the coastal areas and beginning to go inland. Uh, we do this, and then we do uh, these reports, which you see at floodscores.com, which are highly visual and, and really, you know, most people, when they get our reports, go like, oh, I see my house. Yeah, that's where the water accumulates. That's during the last storm. That was what it looked like. How did you guys know that? You've never been out there. And we use Esri ArcView tools to, to really get down into the weeds. Um, and this, per, this is a NOAA facility on Virginia Key, uh, just uh, next to the city of Miami, between Miami and Key Biscayne. And we've done about 12 NOAA facilities. And people say, well, do NOAA, NOAA's a customer. Why would NOAA use you guys? Can't they do the same thing? Don't you use NOAA data? And the answer is, of course we do. But we do these reports in seconds, and we charge, and we charge for a commercial facility $499, and they can't do it in seconds for $499. So what does NOAA do with our report? They dimension the, the, the uh, flood barriers that they need to protect the site they staple the cost estimate with our report and they put it in the budget. Nothing to do with insurance. It has to do with protection and resilience. Our engine also will produce damage loss estimates um, so that we're giving the hazard output, we're giving the output to this part of the model of inundation and frequency, and then we have a hazardous type model that will model damage and loss and business interruption at the individual property level. This was an article, the insurance thought leadership I, I had published a couple of weeks ago. And it talks about why FEMA flood maps aren't good enough. Uh, they don't include heavy rainfall. They don't, uh, they're not adjusted for tidal flood and sea level rise. The riverine model is not really, um, doesn't look at LIDAR, it just has 1% across a very large area or 0.2%, 100 year or 500 years. And we use the NOAA slosh model, which we add some, some value to uh, using LIDAR and using uh, tide gauges, local tide gauges. But typically, and I think in the majority of cases, a NOAA slosh height is higher than the FEMA base flood elevation. And they kind of know that. But yet, from a consumer standpoint, from the insured standpoint, from the commercial property owner standpoint, you know, engineers and architects saying, well, you know, we're just going to go with the FEMA base flood elevation. You know, that's what the code requires. <clears throat> so they never see that the slosh height is much higher than the BFE. But we show that, and that's, we want people. To be, um, to be educated in that regard. I know there's a lot of text on here, but let me just summarize it. The challenges to going global, where here in the US, we've built our system on a billion plus dollars of federal government uh, data, free data, 
uh, FEMA models, uh, slosh models, other data from USGS, groundwater data, soils data. And we're very fortunate. I, I understand that we are very fortunate because we were able to incorporate all these data sets into this engine that we created. And we don't have that uh, in, in, in foreign countries, and we're now looking in South America. So, you know, we need to get, in the U.S., we either use one meter resolution LIDAR or USGS three meter resolution DEMs. But to get that in foreign countries is going to be very expensive. And we have to figure out who's willing to pay for that to build out our system uh, globally. And here's sort of uh, an example of Peru. We're going to be doing some work in Peru to try to prove out whether we can uh, make our system work. So we have um, LIDAR, where, you know, Airbus, uh, property boundary data, the local jurisdictions, we've got to get that. Riverine models, we'll start with a European Commission data. Um, tide gauge, UNESCO, storm surge is not applicable. Sea level rise, we're going to do that ourselves from tide gauges and the literature, uh, soils and groundwater, and then Peru specific modeling and data collection and peer review and universities, what have you. So how do you go global when there's no FEMA flood map equivalent? Um, how do you get um, the, the inundation that we, we have from a FEMA map uh, and the frequencies, which you know, are, are, are not totally unreasonable in the riverine context? They, are, they don't do, obviously, the, the pluvial um, and the X zone has created, especially with Harvey type rainfalls, has created you know, very, very serious problems. But how are we going to do that? And we're, we're looking at River Track and HydroBid and uh, the GIS flood tool and others that may be rapidly rolled out and scaled up. And I just would say, first of all, if you see anything that I've said or hear anything that I've said or anything up here and you want to come up to me afterward and say, I've got a great idea of how you can do this faster and more cost effectively, believe me, we are absolutely open to anybody that wants to wants to help out. So, so we currently have a four-cylinder model under the hood uh, that is generating these reports at floodscores.com. And the first cylinder, we'll call it the riverine cylinder, we show the customer two frames. In the top frame is the FEMA flood zones for your property. This is Muskegee, Oklahoma. This is a river. This is called the Port of Muskegee. Who knew? that they had a port. Um, these are the FEMA flood zones, the base flood elevation. But then using LIDAR, we recast the, the, the frequencies of flooding based on a, a reinterpretation, a LIDAR reinterpretation. So what you see here within the polygon of the customer's site is yes, there's some 1%, there's even some 0.2%, which is similar, but as you get down to the water, and then you look on the other side of the river here, you go, oh my, that's not 1%, that's 20% annual frequency, 80%, 30%, whatever. And we know that because the, this on the right side of the river, or on the east side, is much lower than the subject property. And when you go out and you talk to people, they go, yeah, floods every year because we're much lower than our, our uh, colleagues on the other side of the river. So this is one of the problems with the FEMA flood zone, which is they, they'll have an A zone, and it's all 1% across the A zone, but we all, most of you as scientists and people who do field work, know that's just not true. So we're reinterpreting in the United States through LIDAR. The storm surge model I mentioned, we're using the slosh grids, we're using LIDAR or the DM. For example, in Miami-Dade County, we have one, one meter resolution. In other places, we have three, three meter resolution. We use the not, we actually put the slosh model on top of the highest non-storm tides in the last 10 years. So we're using a mom, and again, no black box here. I'm telling you exactly what we do. 
and the engine does this in seconds for any property in America. We're taking a mom approach and putting it on top of the highest of the high tides in, in a, the closest tide gauge and interpolation. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, we're showing the storm surge both in NAVD88, so you can compare it to the elevation certificate and AGL above the ground level, because we want people to know. And then we show the annual strike frequency from that category storm from the National Hurricane Center. And you know, some people say, well, that's not as good as the, the black box of the cat modelers. No, but, but the slosh model is used to evacuate millions of people every year that are, that are in the way of an incoming hurricane. It's good enough to give the homeowner who's paying $99 for this and all the other information, to give them a sense, whether they're a homeowner or a home buyer, of what I'm looking at if I buy this property. Should I buy it? Yes or no. Should I sell it now? Yes or no. Should I protect it? Yes or no. And how would I protect it? And then should I insure it? And again, I get back to, well, this isn't as technically sophisticated as cat risk modeling, but the point is that most people don't have flood insurance. So if the cat modeling, not saying anything bad about them, they're great, but if that was all that we needed to get people to wake up and buy flood insurance, then everybody would have it. Because nobody would be so irrational as to be in an A zone or in a VE zone or near, you know, the, the, you know in, a, in a hurricane slosh area and not have flood insurance, but they do not have flood insurance. Most people don't. So what do you say about that? Is it just the quality of the data? No. But the risk communication is a very important piece of this. Cylinder three, tidal sea level rise, not included in FEMA flood maps. This is, um, let me see where there's, Miami Beach City Hall. I have a zero flood days in 2018, sea, using the, the, the NOAA regional sea level rise model. We have 70 days, 71 days of tide flooding, plus 15 years, and almost every day, plus 30 years. I didn't make it up. I'm envisioning this so that this is, let's just say this is not City Hall. This is uh, an office building. This is uh, somebody's home. And not every property in Miami Beach or Miami or Savannah or Charleston or Norfolk or the Jersey Shore, not every property shows this. In fact, most of the properties that we model don't show this kind of severe king tide or tidal sea level rise flooding. But what does this mean? It, what it means is, and they do have pumps there, by the way, and those pumps have backup power, Miami Beach. But what if they don't? What if the town can't afford a, a seven foot giant pump to suck all that seawater off the ground surface? What is that gonna mean for the economy of that particular town. That's very important. Uh, then we've developed, um, an, call it the X zone flood model, uh, the precipitation using flow, flow direction, sink, watershed, zonal, fill modeling, DEM, property boundary, drainage layers, soil type, soil runoff, groundwater, and proprietary algorithms. And in seconds, we're modeling every property in America for heavy rainfall flooding right now. This was a property in Houston before Harvey at the edge of Attic's Reservoir. It was a neighborhood. You can see this is a stream. This is our uh, model that this area was lower and was gonna get flooded. And you can see in the drone footage right here, this black area right here, is where the flooding occurred and in the, in, the, in the roadway of this little neighborhood. And you can see flooding in the, in the same western part of the polygon and a little bit of flooding in, in the street. Now, this was a model we did for a REIT uh, that wanted to put a, a PetSmart in here. They didn't. 
This was our groundwater uh, heavy rainfall modeling. This is the, what happened in Kingwood, Texas, drone footage uh, after Harvey. We need this. The, the commercial real estate sector needs it. Homeowners need it. Insurance needs it. They don't have it. They don't have this kind of modeling. Now, I mean, when we think of EO and we think of remote sensing, this type of stuff, which is going to become more and more available, is so important because we can actually, at some time in the future, automate the, you know, showing people the last 10 years of flooding on, on and around a property they want to buy. And in, and with, uh, 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 Brandon's, uh, you know, in the group we were just at, we talked a little bit about blockchain. I'm not going to steal his thunder, but you, you know, to to me, and someone said, I'm a recovering lawyer, but somebody said, well, there could be privacy issues. Not if it's obvious from the street that someone could see something flood. It's there's no privacy. There's no search and seizure. There's no you don't need a warrant if you if you happen to be there and you would see the flooding from the street. There is no privacy issues, but we can get that from satellite data, whether it's Airbus or whether it's government satellite data, and we can actually have consumers, we can balance the scales of justice. Right now, buyers of property, even though we have in many states, uh, caveat emptor, I mean, here, for example, here in Colorado, and I live in Colorado, even though my business is in, um, my business is in Fort Lauderdale, we have radon disclosure. You have to have radon testing. You have to disclose that. It's a requirement of the law. But in many other states, whether it's radon or asbestos or lead paint or lead pipe or uh, mold, you, it's buyer beware. So what, are we, what can we do with this type of information to balance the scales of justice to give consumers this type of information? King tides, a threat multiplier. So this is a couple million dollar property in Fort Lauderdale on a sunny day, fish swimming in the yard, king tides. And you know, when I first started raising this with the insurance companies, they were in king tides, schming tides. Why do we need to, we don't need to know about that. The water's not coming in the front door. Don't tell me about king tides. But now everybody's jumping on the king tide barrier, you know, bandwagon because if this is happening, this is astronomy, this is what we have predicted based on tide gauges in South Florida, that these new moons and full moons and the highest of the high tides for 2018, this is astronomy, everybody, is gonna be on October 9th. So the highest king tide in South Florida is gonna be on October 9th. We know it because it's the sun and the moon and the earth. It has nothing to do with storms, it has nothing to do with anything. So this property is gonna look like this on October 9th, we know that. But what is October 9th? It's the height of the Atlantic hurricane season. And if the storm comes in and rides on top of this, what's happening to this $2 million home? Why does an insurance company want to know every king tide affected property in the coast of the United States and the world that's affected by tropical storms because it's a threat multiplier? We need to give this information. We are giving this information. So here's a, an example of a hotel in Miami Beach, a very nice Art Deco hotel, historic hotel. This red line is the FEMA base, base flood elevation. These are category four and five hurricanes. And this is the current and future king tide for business interruption. And what this shows you is and I will guarantee this, without a pump, this will be a ghost building long before it would be taken down by any hurricane. Because who is gonna to wanna to get out of their car and walk through salt water to get into the restaurant at the Alden Hotel? Not my wife with her Manola Blahnik or, or Jimmy Choo's. She's not getting out of the car and taking her $1,000 or whatever was on sale at Nordstrom's Rack or whatever. No, she's not going to do that. And neither would your girlfriend or significant other wife wanna get out of the car and go into the Alden Hotel. So pumps are going to be critical in the future 
given sea level rise. So the blue area here, so I'm gonna check on my time. The blue area is insured and the red zone is uninsured unless you have business interruption insurance, okay? Hurricane Florence, this is what happened in New Bern. Uh, you probably all read the article of the, you know, the low, the, you know, the um, low income housing there and the poor people that got flooded out. Our modeling uh, of Cat 1 and heavy rainfall, and there are synergies, including natural hazards, um, heat stress, cooling degree days, and droughts, uh, automating for additional fee, the damage ratio, economic loss. But this is, I want to focus on this uh, because I want to sort of transition in the few minutes that we have left. My co founders and I, about a year, year and a half ago, decided that we're not in the bad news business. We're not the bad news bears. We're in the resilience business. And what that means is it's not enough to say, here's your bad news, have a nice life, don't let the door hit you on the way out. I didn't get into this after I retired. Uh, to, to do that. I got in this to help people to save property and save lives. So we developed a piece of code that you can, we can, with the client, pro, uh, propose a hypothetical barrier, this polygon here, this is Miami City Hall, a hypothetical barrier of whatever height, and then model instantaneously before and after return on investment of any barrier, assuming that barrier is effective. What we don't, we're not you know, warranting barrier systems. We're just saying, if you wanna envision a barrier system, we can model that instantaneously for any type of flooding. Uh, and then of course, if it's heavy rainfall flooding, you gotta put a pump on the inside and pump the water out. So we have a help desk and we call it flood protection as a service. Uh, we do the vulnerability, we do engineering evaluations, financing, implementation, annual maintenance and certification. And then number four is if your insurance agent can't get you a reduction in the premium after you put something like this in, then we know people who can do that. And so we're not in the bad news business. We're matching flood defense systems with the risk. And you know, this is a picture I took in New Orleans during a very heavy rainstorm, but no, not a, a, a tropical storm. And there was a pizza parlor and the guy's out there throwing sandbags. And that may be perfectly appropriate for his circumstances and his financial bandwidth. But somebody else might want to put in a European self-closing flood barrier, or somebody else might want to put into their home to block an area off that has had flooding, or the Porta Dam system, or the, um, the Mega Secure that's been FM approved. So we have risk consultants that are on the phone with our clients, trying to help them save lives and save property. So new technologies um, like IoT, crowdsourcing, AI, real-time weather, and augmented reality will help, and they will be the, the wave of the future. But you have to have that grounded in modeling of where the high-risk areas are. You have to understand where to put a sensor. Well, where am I going to put that sensor? Well, you're gonna put it where the models tell you to. And then there's a feedback loop that, that says, oh yeah, that you modeled that, and then the sensor showed there was a whole bunch of flooding there, and it, it feeds back and it gets better and better. Satellite data in the future, you guys know a lot more about this, but combine AI and machine learning, remote sense data to produce intelligence, individualized property data, it can help with the insurance underwriting, cost to rebuild, damage loss estimates, um, oops, sorry, uh, residential and commercial due diligence, which I talked about, image recognition, value estimate of buildings and cost to rebuild, that's sort of redundant, and vegetation analysis with wildfire risks. So this is a mall that floods all the time uh, in South Florida. Uh, cars float away. They haven't done anything with the parking lot. And, and yet, if we have modeling and we have some sensors and if we have alarm systems that tell the ladies shopping in the mall at noontime, hey, you know what, we got a storm coming in 
it's we think it's of a certain type of rainfall you really need to get your cars out of here or else they're going to be floating away or we're going to close the barriers which we don't have now but we could have in the future so there's a lot to be done with the you know iot and with you know incoming real-time weather but it again i think it's based on modeling and then you know our modeling mo we can model every property in the united states and with augmented reality somebody with a gps enabled smartphone could take a picture of their home upload it to our app which doesn't exist yet uh, it could be modeled and then as weather's coming in if it fits a certain profile of a certain storm surge of a certain rainfall event then we'll come back to them and show them what it's going to look like on their property and then they can decide am i going to evacuate i'm not going to evacuate uh, i'm going to lower some shutters or raise a barrier or do whatever is appropriate so um, i'm pretty much run out of time now i mean i can go through a bunch of cases the, this is going to be available the the slide deck and there's a whole bunch of other slides but i'm pretty much you know going to open it for any questions now um, and uh, thank you very much for for your time appreciate it thanks albert questions Yagi yeah, or Jim? I, I think that's true. This happened, that happened to be a heavy rainfall uh, situation in um, the Sawgrass Mills Mall, which is outside of the surge zone in, in South Florida. But um, I think your point is very well taken. I, I agree with that. Uh, someone had a slide, uh, I think it may have been Laurie, uh, that um, uh, a picture's worth a thousand actions. And I really like that. I mean, because I always say a picture's worth a thousand words, but I really like, and I'm going to probably, you know, plagiarize that and, and use that, that a picture's worth a thousand actions, because we're trying to knock people off the fence. I mean, we're not an advocacy group, so we have nothing to do with climate mitigation. Uh, I, I you know, know Al Gore quite well. A uh, law school friend of mine, Kenny Berlin, runs Climate Reality. I spoke at Climate Reality uh, in Miami in front of 1,200 people, and in three days, I was the only person that said the word adaptation. And when he introduced me, the vice president said, because I'm Albert and he's Albert and this is Albert, uh, he said, uh, I, five years ago, I said that adaptation is laziness, and I really regret that, and I want to introduce somebody who has a new startup who's trying to help you know, with technology to do adaptation. But the, but the point that I'm trying to make is that 
that we do want people to take action to, to become more resilient. So if we're advocating anything, it's resiliency, not CO2 mitigation. Um, I think it's, it's uh, again, this is more of the science team, but we wanted to get free things, free data that was readily accessible that could kind of plug and play with the modeling engine and the, and the report generating engine. And I think what we've seen very, very clearly is when we go into South America, we, we can't do that anymore. So we're going to have to go to satellite data and, and remote sensing right now, I mean, I'm talking about in the next couple of weeks uh, when we have this pilot project in Peru. So we're, we're there, you know, we're, we're, this is US done, works, reasonably accurate for the purposes that, we, that people use it for. And now we're going to other places in the world where we're gonna have to immediately go to all the available databases that are uh, satellite um, and remote sensing. You know, that, you know, I, I would have to, you know, we have a team, they have a whole QA, QC, uh, peer reviewing, field true thing, going in after the events uh, uh, and, and trying to look at data, which includes drone data, which includes um, information from local governments. And, and then we do have a program to, um, to, to make sure that our, our stuff is accurate. And um, that's an ongoing process. So I'm not gonna you know, lie, you know, it's an ongoing process. To answer your question, what's an acceptable error rate? I, I, I can't really answer that. I'd have to refer you to Dr. Soden, but I would just say that in my, and I know this is anecdotal and I'm not a scientist, but it's creepy how every time we talk to a customer, and they see the report, they're going, how did you know that that's where it floods on all of the different um, areas of flooding? And so we've never had anybody get a report and say, this is crap, it's, it has nothing to do with my property, because we do it for, I mean, we do it for buyers, but we also do it for owners. So people who have lived there for 30 years, and go, that's exactly the corner, and now I'm gonna to have to do something about that before I sell this, or I'm getting it ready for sale, and I know I've gotta do something over there, whether level it out, or raise it, or do something, put a wall around it. So um, it's a good point. We do have a process, and, and we have, I feel very confident of our science team that they have created a system that is, I say bad enough or good enough. You know, the information is bad. Is the bad news is good enough to make not design decisions. We're not at a design level. So when we bring in architects and engineers to look at our modeling and our reports, and they're now going to design. And I didn't really. Let me just see if I can flip through here for one second. Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't have it in this one, but. Um, I will take just this one. This house was built uh, 
up uh, from five, from three and a half feet to six feet based on our modeling. Uh, this is an actual home in Fort Lauderdale in one of the floodiest areas. And uh, this gentleman, uh, Stanley Young, bought uh, a 1923 mansion that was owned by the billionaire Wayne Hazenga, who was a blockbuster video and auto nation and waste management. And he knocked down the mansion and he was going to build this spec home. And he came to us and he said, well, how high do I have to raise it for it to be safe? And we said, it's three and a half feet, NAVD 88, you have to go to six feet. So he brought in millions of dollars of fill and then built this unbelievable home on, and sold it. It's a, you know, I don't know, 10 million, 8 million, a you know, very expensive home. So we don't, we didn't do the final design. We, you know, engin his engineers and architects do that. But most of the architects and engineers are going like, FEMA BFE is good enough for me. I've been using it for the last 30 years. And that's what's in the code of Fort Lauderdale is you got to do it to the BFE or above the B. No, that's not science. So we know that our science, to get back to your point of accuracy, we know that it's good science and that it can form the basis of resilience decisions. I don't know if that if that's satisfying, but that's that's my response. Uh, it's called round A uh, venture capital. <laughs> when we get our round A venture capital, then we can develop the uh, the uh, augmented reality. We know how to do it. I mean, we know, we actually know how to do that uh, that, that that smartphone augmented reality app, uh, and it really would cost a lot less money than you think. So, if anybody here knows any uh, venture capitalists, you can send them my way. I'm shameless, I mean, by the way I'm saying. Oh, no. No, it's our, pri pri anybody who's a customer, there's a privacy policy, you know, we keep everything under lock and key and, you know, try to prevent hackers. I mean, it's just like any company. We take credit cards. We, we have a privacy data and privacy policy. So, no, but, but for a, a, a government building, yes, if we do work for a government building, then we can release that data because, at least under Florida laws, you know, under open records, it's anything that you give to uh, to to a local government to a government agency in Florida is is, is not pub, is not private. No, no, no. Either way, if you're a customer whether you're on one side or the other side, or you're just an interested observer, if you buy it, then it's private to you and you could share it. You, you bought it, you, could, you, you can't publicly share it. We, we have certain terms and conditions that prohibit you. It's for your personal use, but if you wanted to show it to your brother, I mean, we're not gonna come and, and sue you uh, but you can't post it on Facebook or something. Yeah, that happens every day. That's, those are. Can uh, I buy that yes. I ask? No, no, so you can buy, I can it. buy it. Also. Yes, right. Yeah. Yes. 
for them to settle or put foot in. We know it's going to be tight the first time we met in the pulpit when you said you know, 15 years ago, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, is there is there going to be a debt base or anything? Mm-hmm. That's why we carry $2 million worth of professional liability insurance. <laughs> and we've never been sued, but, you know, um, yeah, no, we have very, you know, as, as is everybody else. I mean, whether you're an engineering firm and you were doing this by hand, you're a coastal engineering firm, you're doing it by hand, or whether you're doing it in an automated process, it's the same thing that if you have errors in emissions or negligence, which I'm not saying is impossible, um, but I'm just saying that we uh, take what you know all the the right precautions that our modeling is not uh, in, in error, and then we carry insurance like everybody else does to protect ourselves and to pay claims if in fact something did go wrong. No. Oh yeah, we sell, we've sold thousands of them to date and we sell them to, as I say, to NOAA, we sell them, we've sold them to the military, we've sold it to buyers, we've sold it to sellers, we've so- sold it to people who live from paycheck to paycheck and we tell them when, we, when they call for their complimentary uh, advice, um, you know, go down to Walmart and buy this barrier in a bag it's got a four star review on Amazon and it's 50 bucks. And then we represent billionaires who, this one particular case, uh, he w- wanted our advice about buying a $4 million home in Palm Beach to tear it down and build an $8 million home that's higher. And, you know, am I going to get to the bike path? And how's my wife going to get into Palm Beach to shop? And am I going to take my Rolls Royce through saltwater? And what do you think Palm Beach is going to do about pumps and and seawalls? And and, and so it it starts with a report, but then it goes into, for us, a fee-for-service help desk. The help desk isn't free. The initial call is free, but then the help desk is consulting. And so um, right now we're, we're, we're doing a hotel acquisition in Miami. A beach that started with a four hundred ninety nine dollar report and now has thirty thousand dollars of consulting fees uh, because we need they want to know how long is the beach going to last and with king tides and sea level rise, how many hours a day in in the year in today and the years to come will we have enough beach for people to enjoy themselves on so our our modeling goes from the technology here 's your report instantaneously to how can we help you make decisions and get more resilient? All right, last question and then we'll probably move on. You know, I mean, it's sort of a good point, but typically what we'll do is we do have a QA, QC process. So the, the, we get an address online and we send out um, a little aerial photograph and we confirm that it's what the customer, it's the customer's property. Then we push a button and the report comes out and then it goes around to whoever's on call and the science team. But if we have any questions about it, then we will redo it using, we'll go into other databases, we'll see if there's a closer tide gauge data, a tide gauge, we'll, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of examples, um, but um, there are occasions where we would feel uncomfortable because it might be in a blank zone or it might, but I haven't, seen a situation, I've seen situations where we've done more work and we just lose money on the sale, but I've never seen a a situation where the team came back and said, I just can't do a report here. Yes, we currently are doing a human QAQ, two-part QAQC. Immediately send the aerial photograph, 
with the with the property boundary is that your home is that your property yes push a button and then the report comes out and it goes to whoever on the science teams on call and i just wanted that because i didn't want a like a web app fully automated whatever because i don't believe in that as as, as far as you know having a professional quality report so well thank you very much so much albert